Es un privilegio que estén el día de hoy con, con nosotros en, en otro evento más de, de The Walt Disney, ahora con, con Star Wars. Y, y muy contentos también. Eh, antes de iniciar la conferencia, me, me encantaría platicarles que el día de hoy Coco llegó a los 20 millones de asistentes en México. Y también estamos cerca de los mil millones de pesos en recaudación, una cifra que que nunca se había visto en, en México, así que estamos muy orgullosos y gracias a todos ustedes, espero que la hayan visto y que también la hayan eh, gozado tres veces, y, pero y, esos cabrones, y ya está llorado con nosotros, así que bueno, eh, pues tres estamos veces, muy lloré, contentos wey. porque tenemos a, al director, al productor, al talento de, de una de las franquicias más queridas y más adoradas en todo el mundo, sí, pero que regrese, y, Lucas. y bueno, este, pues Star Wars se estrena en México el 14 de diciembre, para que, para que no se la pierdan. Y bueno, para mí es un gran privilegio poder invitar a nuestra conferencia de prensa a Ryan Johnson, que es el director de Star Wars, Los Últimos Jedi. Le pido un aplauso, por favor, a, para recibir a Ryan. Las fotos serán al final, así que no se preocupen. Thank you, Ryan. Welcome to Mexico. Fotos. Fotos. También nos acompaña el productor, a quien le pido un fuerte aplauso, Ram Berman, por favor. Adelante, Ram. Una actriz que no necesita presentación, muy, muy, muy joven, muy, muy guapa. Y demos un aplauso a Ray, que es Daisy Ridley, por favor. Y por último, alguien que, que ha crecido con mucho de, de nosotros y que es un gran personaje, que lo, que lo queremos. Una gran persona, además. Un fuerte aplauso para Mark Hamill. Thank you guys for being here. Okay, es, si pueden tomar asiento, por favor. Uh, if you want to, to use the headset translation. Eh, de, eh, las preguntas pueden ser en inglés o en español, tenemos eh, traducción simultánea. Entonces, vamos a empezar, por favor. Por ahí les dimos unas, unas paletitas, unos eh, hand, hand signals. Por favor, ¿quién, nos, ¿quién tiene por ahí? Empezamos con la primera pregunta. Ok, adelante, por favor. Nombre y medio, por favor. Um, de pie, por favor, gracias. Yeah, just a bit. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, guys. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. I'm here. Um, I wanted to ask you, Mark. all of you, what do you think Star Wars has become when it comes uh, as a way of living through pop culture in the last few decades? What do you think Star Wars is right now in the world? And why I think do you need to take a look at one we have loved these many years with the Star Wars. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having us. We've had such an amazing welcome here in Mexico City. It's a real joy to be here. Um, uh, I, I mean, Star Wars, it's, it's many things. It's something that I know that um, I and a lot of us grew up with. It's also, though, for me, the most amazing thing is to see um, both people my age who are wearing the t-shirts and who are into Star Wars, but also in Halloween to see little girls dressed as Rey, or to see how it crosses all generations. Um, and there's very few things out there right now in the world that do that, and that speak to a message that's positive, and that give kids today kind of a roadmap to kind of find their place in the world and, and try and try and follow the, follow the light side. So I think it's more important today than it ever has been. The movies were always very optimistic. Um, they came out in a time post Watergate, uh, post Vietnam War, when the usually you had an anti-hero who was embittered 
coming back from the war or the factories closed. I think George chose to put it in a galaxy far, far away because that's as close as you can come to making a, a fairy tale in outer space. And when I read it, I thought, gee, they have a princess, a space pirate, a farm boy, a wizard. It's closer to Wizard of Oz than it is to any science fiction. And particularly today, uh, history repeats itself. We're in a very dark era, and uh, people need that escapism. Whether they want to go to Hogwarts or the Land of Oz or Middle Earth, uh, it's a great place to go to forget about your troubles. And to add to the escapism thing, I, I just think it's amazing because I didn't really grow up with Star Wars, so this has all been like a new thing the past few years. Um, and I just think it's amazing, especially at conventions, to see just people are really kind to each other. Like, Star Wars fans are really lovely to each other. When you go to a convention, people have the most far-fetched ideas as to what the story may be. <laughs> that everybody has a right to an opinion, everybody has a voice, everybody is heard. So you could hear the most insane fan theory, but everyone in that group who's listening to the theory is giving that person the space to have it. So I think there's just an awesome sense of community within the fans. Okay. It's hard for me to add. All I can see, say is that I have two kids, two boys, who are just obsessed with this, and I can't understand why. They've never seen, you know, they've never seen my movie, our movie, but they're just every time Star Wars is on TV, they won't, you know, they won't leave the screen. They just want to get dressed as Don Two Barrel Porgs, and. and, and, and it really is. It's hard to articulate why, but it's just magic. How it's old really are easy. they now? Seven and four. Oh, that's my crowd. <laughs> the young and the mentally young. Okay, thank you. Adelante, por favor. Aquí de pie. Quien la tenga lista, por favor. Gracias. Hi, my question is for Mark and Javier in the middle. In the middle. Um, I'm from CNN, and you have wrote at the same time as Luke Skywalker. How do you think the character and yourself have matured? And how do you feel knowing that Luke is a movie icon as important as Rocky, The Godfather, and even like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz? Thank you. Well, we had in the original trilogy a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there was closure. My father had found redemption, uh, and then you would just speculate. It, you know, we all lived happily ever after, and uh, as you'll discover in the Last Jedi, uh, things haven't gone the way you'd expect. Uh, it was—it's a much darker uh, place for Luke to be. Ryan pushed me out of my comfort zone, and it was scary, you know. Uh, because Luke did represent hope and optimism. and uh, But you know, you need conflict. If I were another sort of benign uh, trainer of uh, young Padawans, we've seen that before. And I think the real challenge for any writer or director is to deliver all the elements that you, the audience wants to see in a Star Wars film, the spectacular battles and special effects and exotic creatures, the wonderful character relationships, and the humor is so important. Uh, but to find ways to surprise people, which is getting more and more difficult with each film, because the, the audience has seen so much. But uh, I think they're, if they're as shocked as I was to read the script, the audience is in for a, a great time at the movies with, uh, with this film. And by the way, I don't think of myself as Rocky or any of those. Not when you know, you're know you at home and your wife is telling you to take out the trash and <laughs> pick up your room. It's very mundane existence. Thank you. Por ahí, por favor. Si quieres, ponte de pie y para que lo vean. Hi, good morning. Para Jonathan, para Mundo Mórbido y Mórbido TV, una pregunta para Mark Hamill. ¿Cómo te sentiste el primer día 
de regreso como Luke Skywalker en un rodaje de una nueva película de Star Wars, ¿te sentiste nervioso o no sé si temeroso, emocionado, por lo que pudieran pensar los fans? Y para todos, ¿qué significa ser parte del universo de Star Wars? Gracias. Sí, yes, well, coming back was a, a thrill, but enormously intimidating. You know, we had a beginning, middle, and end, and I thought, how, why mess with that? You know, we always expected the the future trilogies would feature all new characters that they wouldn't need us. Uh, but you know, you have to rise to the challenge. And I, I thought it was interesting. The first day I met Ryan, and he came to visit and get to know one another. And I confessed to him, I'm terrified. <laughs> You know, I like little films. I did Brigsby Bear this year. We drive around in suburbia in cars. You know, Star Wars is almost too high profile for comfort. So I was surprised when I confessed how terrified I was. He said, I am too. And I thought, wow, he didn't have to admit that. Well, I bonded with him at that very moment. Because <laughs> if I really intellectually uh, imagined how big it really was, I would just be crippled with fear. Uh, so I had to pretend it was a small art house film that the critics would embrace, but the audiences would uh, reject in mass numbers. That's what I, I pretended. It's fun to pretend. Yeah, and the, just adding what Mark said, that there were the kind of those two layers, I think. For me, coming into it as kind of, you know, as, as, as the new kid, there was first kind of the shock and awe of we're doing Star Wars with a capital SW, kind of the big picture of it. Um, but then once we actually started working, I didn't find that it took a lot of effort to fool ourselves into thinking we were making a smaller movie. It right. felt very intimate, and I think that's a testament to just the group of people that we had working on it, to you guys, to the whole cast. It just everyone kind of was, our eyes were on the right target, I think, right. of just making an interesting movie. And when you put your eyes on that target, everything around you kind of shrinks down, and you're just trying to tell a story. And that's what it felt like, I think. Well, I think you're so focused on what you're doing in the moment, you can't think about facing all you guys a year and a half later. That's when I should be really scared. I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Aquí tenemos una más, por favor. Nombre y medio. Hi, Gabriel. Hi, Gabriel from uh, Public Metro. Uh, this is for, for the producer. Uh, Star Wars has some of the best special effects and movie um, and spaceships and weapons of the cinema. Uh, how is to balance that? Uh, to, to have to use big sets like, like the Millennium Falcon and improve the, the special effects with every movie so people also have a sensation of, uh, of wow. I mean, our approach initially was, you know, we wanted to do as much as possible practical. So we ended up building like almost like 120 sets, which is like insane amount of number of sets. And then we always, of course, have to complement it with visual effects. And we have the great team at ILM that was headed by visual effects named Ben Morris, who work with Ryan. And you know, I cannot really tell you how, what a fantastic job they've done. And we also had Neil Scanlon, who was a creature effects guy. So we, you know, hopefully push the envelope a little bit and doing a lot of things practically, but also with the help of the visual effects. Ok, thank you. Eh, por ahí hay una pregunta. Eh, Radio Disney. ¿Te pones de pie, por favor? Ah, a mí me dieron el micrófono, pero no soy Radio Disney. <laughs> ok, bueno, si, si ya lo tienes, empecemos contigo y después Radio Disney, por favor. Eh, hi, uh, Gonzalo Lira, from Cinema Mobile. Uh, I would like to ask something to Daisy. 
Uh, I think that uh, we've, uh, we've noticed that in this film, uh, Mark or Luke uh, is, is also a protagonist with you. Uh, given the, given the, what's happening right now in Hollywood, uh, the debate around the place of women uh, in Hollywood, what, how important do you think that it is to uh, man maintain a, a female character uh, as strong and as important as your character was in the first uh, in the first film of this new trilogy. Um, I really don't think there's any um, way that anyone could think it wasn't a good thing. Um, but what I think actually is especially amazing about this is Ray was created by Michael, JJ, and Larry, three men, and Ray continues to be created by men. Obviously, there are women in that team. Kathy is incredible and runs Lucasfilm. But I think what's brilliant is the combination of the two because we can't do one thing without the other. We can't just have, we can't have it that just women are feeling progress and men aren't or vice versa. So to be playing an incredibly empowered woman in a wonderful uh, film, uh, surrounded by incredibly empowered characters, everyone is, everyone is and there's diversity and there's equality in this film in particular. I think it's, um, for me, like, and I didn't even really think about it until yesterday, I suddenly thought, oh, that was, that was by incredibly empowered men who, who could see what needed to be done and have done it, I think, brilliantly. So I feel very, very lucky to be in the hands that I've been um, in with Ryan and with JJ and with Kathy, with everyone at Disney and Lucasfilm. Um, and I think, obviously, it's happening in cinema. Everyone can see it's happening, that there's more representation across the board. Um, and I feel really lucky that I get to be one of those people that is, um, gets to play those empowered roles. Thank you. Thank you. Ahora sí seguimos con Radio Disney, por favor. Uh, hi everyone, Alfonso Gonzalez from Radio Disney. Um, each Star Wars film has a unique tone and a mood. So episode three obviously is a little bit darker and maybe episode seven was <coughs> A little, a uh, little bit lighter. So, which is the tone and the mood for this uh, film, the Last Jedi film? Well, because it's the middle chapter, and because the job of the middle chapter is to kind of challenge the characters, this movie is going to go to some darker places. It's going to be a little bit more, you know, it's going to have a little bit more of 